Hello. Hello. Hello and welcome. Thank you. Just getting my windows lined up here. Okay, great. Great. Well, we should probably do this like the TV show. So who are you and uh, what do you do? <laughs> well, I'm Austin Wintry. Um, and the shortest version of that is that I'm a composer. I basically spend seven days awake, sunrise to sunset, trying to solve musical problems. <laughs> Ooh, I like that. So I'm Keith Spiro, and I have a program called Communicast, which is telling the stories of good people doing great things in our communities and interesting things. And what caught my eye about what you're doing were the words curiosity and experimentation when I went looking through your website and things. I think that's a fair description, or at least I hope so. Um, I, uh, I'm lucky that I've had a fairly steady stream of musical opportunities the last almost 20 years. Um, and that's definitely been a thing that broadly unites everything that I've done. Um, in particular, the notion of experimentation where my rule is when I finish a project, I want to feel like at minimum, it's something that I have never tried before. Uh, now, ideally there's bonus points if it's something that it feels like no one's ever tried before, but at minimum, it has to be something that I've never tried before. Um, so that there's just always perpetual kind of frontiers being, being crossed and, 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 uh, and hit upon. So luckily I've been able to keep that going. I always figure I could run out of ideas tomorrow. I don't want to assume, but so far I've been lucky that it seems to be a relatively steady stream of opportunities that really genuinely do invite kicking over a new rock and trying something you never tried. Yeah. And I, you know, you couldn't ask for a better time for this. The whole world is in, ch in change mode, right? The every day you wake up acceleration of changes, artificial intelligence, computers, Bitcoin, you know, you, the list goes on and on. No and that flexibility that. and curiosity, I think is what carries any one of us to being able to, uh, to succeed. So for people who don't know who you are, the big question is what's your claim to fame? If you had to pick one piece or that starting point where you were impressed with what happened yeah uh, without question this would be the game uh, journey that came out um sony playstation game that came out in march of 2012 12 uh, years ago 12 years ago almost exactly um, um in fact what is today march 14th it was 12 years ago yesterday ah. um and uh, so this was a game that was all things considered a relatively small project. It was a small team, relatively small budget. And it was also very unusual in the world of games, even among the kind of sub genre of more esoteric or so-called indie games. It was unusual. It was very short. The game is less than two hours long, which in video game terms is the you know the blink of an eye yeah, 12 years ago also that was long for the period it was uh it was uh well it was very very short for the period back then you'd be hard pressed to find a game that's less than 20 hours yeah. uh now it runs the gamut but because there are games that are you know well north of 100 hours long um and then there's there's plenty of games what we call live ops games or games as service which are technically infinite in their in their length um and so even shorter ones you'd still be looking at 10 hours maybe six so a game that's 90 minutes basically feature film length was extremely unusual mm -hmm. it also had a lot of unusual aspects to it in terms of it had this very anonymized online matchmaking system where you would connect with a single other person and you would have no way of knowing who they are, how old they are, where they, in the world they live, what language they speak, none of that. All you knew is that it was a person. And uh, so the game explored, you know, the kind of touch points of Joseph Campbell's uh, hero's journey, sort of the so-called motto myth that he details in his rather seminal book, The Hero of a Thousand Faces, and has the player kind of step through those in a very sort of mythic and archetypal literature kind of way. And there's no text or on-screen information that's just experiential. There's no dialogue. There's not one word that's said. So I ended up in the curiously lucky position that the music 
carries a pretty big burden of the storytelling um, as a result, in almost a silent film kind of way. There are sound effects, but they're relatively subtle, all things considered. So when the game came out and was just this unexpected, massive hit, it kind of dragged the music along with it because the music was so featured in the game. It's one of those where I, I really mostly, I think, just got very lucky. My, my, my role had been to not screw up this beautiful, poetic, poignant game they were making. And... Um, because it put a big spotlight on me as soon as it came out, and so sure. yeah, once that came out, it it um, my my career took just a hard turn and it has really never resembled anything like it was prior it's to often, it's, that. It's still going. So I, I want, it raises a question: when you say that your job was to put some music to this and the music carries it, when they handed you the assignment or you looked at what you needed to do, what was your inspiration? How did you make? It almost sounds like it builds to a crescendo and. I'm just curious as to how you go about it. Well, it's hard to generalize or, or summarize that because um, it was a three-year process. I wrote the music from the early days of 2009 all the way till mm. you know February or so of 2012. So it was a nearly daily, iterative, experimenting kind of process where where the game in the earliest days didn't exist other than an elevator pitch of what they were hoping they could make. So it's not like I was handed, here's a game, please add, please add music. It was, here's our goal of a thing we want to make, join in from the starting gate. And so I would write music. Sometimes I would, I would write a sketch based on a conversation that I would have. Or the art director, Matt Nava, would make a painting saying, here's an area of the game that, here's kind of my attempt to describe what I think it will feel like. It'll be a painting full of movement and energy. And I'd write a piece inspired by that, and that sort of thing. And then over time, as the game starts to come into early stages of development, I could actually tangibly write pieces that say, okay, you know, work with the engineers and say, when the, when the player enters into this area, I want to trigger this piece of music and it needs to be one that loops until they leave this little area. And if they're in this area for a long period of time, I want this aspect of the melody to go away, leaving behind only these accompanimental elements, that sort of thing, and develop this kind of, interactive scaffolding so that the music is tightly wrapped around whatever the player is doing at any given moment. And eventually, you know, it wasn't even that we felt like, okay, we're done. It was more like, we're out of time. We got to release this thing. Oh. And otherwise I'm convinced we'd still be working on it. Is it like conducting or being the musician in a silent movie then to some aspects? Because there are people today who actually, you know, there's a whole movement bringing back some of the silent movies or the original movies with, live piano player certainly here in manchester it's it's a popular piece yeah absolutely i have a i have a friend who uh built a whole recording studio around an organ that he bought which was the classic um uh wurlitzer organ that was owned by 20th century fox and was on their scoring stage the alfred newman scoring stage for many years and then they kind of decommissioned it and mothballed it and he bought it off of them and uh built a whole studio around it and will and he'll he'll uh host uh silent film screening nights at his studio for fun and have a have an organist come in and and play uh live to picture like in the old days so it's definitely seen a little bit of a, a revival here in la as well um instigated by the fact that he has this magnificent organ to showcase uh, for it and in any case um i would say it's similar to that in a way but um the big X factor that has no resemblance to silent film is that the player is in charge. You, so if you are in this given area and you want to explore and look around, you could spend 20 minutes doing so, or you could just barrel right through and be in there for 30 seconds. And the music is designed to accommodate either scenario and everything on the spectrum in between. That's not something that even an improvising you know, theater organist or pianist would ever have to contend with. The film is on rails. The film will be whatever is in the cut, but games are not like that. In fact, we even do a live version of Journey where someone plays live and I'm conducting the orchestra and we have all these hand signals in order to make wow. the orchestra follow the player's choices no matter what. And we don't pre-choreograph that. We don't know what they're going to do. That, to me, that's amazing. You know, the the flexibility of musicians going off score or if they're waiting on signals from you as as the conductor. Yeah, that's exactly how it works. And it's as you can imagine, it's it's challenging to rehearse because you don't you have to rehearse uh, the 
the contingencies. It's not like you're rehearsing a precise set of of moments that will happen. You're you have to kind of make guesses about what will happen and rehearse those, and then just hope that that ends up bearing a resemblance to the reality of what ends up happening. It's really it's fun. Amazing. It's a bit of a high wire act, but it's fun. Well, well that's it. A little little high energy or high stress, little blood pressure growth for. <laughs> I think so. That. But part of that, you know, for people who are not overly familiar with the uh, the game or journey, uh, you were nominated for a Grammy Award. It was it was a very lucky break. Uh, you know, yeah. it was one of those. Again, it, it it's funny because I don't really know what, if anything, it means. You know, it's fun. I enjoy going to the Grammys uh, because I I get to see friends of mine. I don't get to see that often because it's like a thing that gets us all out of our studios. But um, but it's it's easy to, I think, uh, assign it more weight than it really ought to have. Uh, but as you can tell, I do enjoy, in the same way that I, I know endless piles of useless Oscar trivia, I do enjoy the kind of trivia side of it and the, the technical sides and the- Sure, does that, that, does that make you a angle? better composer for video games because of that attention to detail? <laughs> Perhaps, if nothing else, I- <laughs> You know, the attention to detail means that I make very accurate spreadsheets, and I don't know how you could possibly write music for games if you weren't very organized and meticulous right. on a technical level. You know, it sort of flies in the face of the antiquated notion of being right brain versus left brain. I think to score games, you really need to be equally both because it is a highly technical endeavor and i that's what i love about it i mean i score films i write theater music i do i do a lot of different things but nothing remotely comes close to the level of technical interest that games has for and me. i sense almost there's there's mathematics behind it too you know with music has mathematics and timing for soundtrack instead of a game but then oh yeah it's, variables it's just... if somebody lingers as opposed to zooming through a room so let me oh, yeah. do goes, another question. Well beyond, yeah. yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, that's okay. You're coming to New Hampshire, and you here we are 12 years after this started, and we have a Game Overture, the Symphony New Hampshire. How did you get involved with Symphony New Hampshire, and what brings you here? This is all thanks to uh, their conductor, Roger Collier. Roger and I have been friends for many years, and he's conducted Journey many times, probably more ah. than any other single conductor beyond myself. Um, I've been lucky that the music has been performed a lot over the years, um, but um, Roger has seen to it that you know the Pacific Symphony and the Pacific Symphony Youth Orchestra um, has done it. He's, you know, uh, his orchestra, he has another group, the Evansville uh, Philharmonic in, in uh, Indiana uh, that um, has done it. And he's just been a, a very lovely supporter. And I, and I, and I love working with him. He's a yeah. terrific conductor. He, he he's great... phenomenal. I just met him this year at the 100th anniversary of Symphony New Hampshire. I went to cover it uh, wow. at an event, uh, the group I work with, which is Inklink News and Arts and Culture was like, let's go cover this. And it was interesting. But I've been yeah, to these concerts terrific. since. And when listening to you talk and all of these pieces, when you were talking about how it's put together and the flexibility of, you know, if the player hesitates or spends more time in an area. And immediately I thought of Roger because the shows that I saw performed this year, you have Symphony Masala, which was all American instruments nothing from native India and yet they covered recreated Bollywood. Yeah. I, he's talked to me about that show. I I've heard about it. It sounded, uh, it was astounding glorious. to watch the audience and the audience, you know, you talk about engagement in the players, the audience ended up participating the way they hooted or, or complimented. It was just, you could have been in the middle of a Bollywood set and it was a wonderful, yeah. that was followed by Sandeep Das using a tabla. Right. And he doesn't read music. And I was there for the rehearsals because for me, it's, it's a fascinating thing to watch how these yeah. are put together. And the musicians, the orchestral musicians, you know, are used to very structured timing. And Sandy, you know, don't worry, I'll fit right in. And, and so watching Roger pull those pieces together, it's it's, you know, his track record this year is, is phenomenal as far as I'm concerned for that whole creativity, experimentation, curiosity which brings in a whole new level of, of potential patrons for classical music, you know, and I think that's part of the excitement of this is it's very different. 
Yeah, I mean, that's one of those where the the orchestra as an entity is capable of so much and and even even if you relegate it to the most rigorously traditional, you know, purely acoustic in a traditional hall, none of the thing, no amplification, no video projection, any of those kinds of things. Even if you just perform it the way it theoretically is most traditionally performed, it is capable of such versatility. Um, and I've always found it disheartening how many orchestras seem to see themselves as museums. And while I, I, I'm a strong believer in stewardship of this incredible canon of music that we have. I mean, I am a, I am a, you know, my sitting on my floor right here is a stack of conductor scores of everything from the opera works of uh, Puccini and Gounod and, and Verdi and, and uh, recently went to an amazing production of this much more obscure Austrian early 20th century composer named uh, Zemlinski um, to the, the, Symphonic repertoire, you know, these are things that I keep in arm's reach at all the, at, at all times. I'm a big believer in that canon, but I also think for the first 500 years of the development of the orchestra, it was always committed to playing what was current. Um, and then in the 20th century, when this schism happened, uh, that uh, is its own complicated thing, but well worth reading about in John Mao Cherry's phenomenal book called The War on Music that I, I highly recommend to mm. everyone. Um, the orchestra suddenly became either some very small subset said we only perform music of the future except their version of that meant the the future as being outlined by the the you know the schoenbergs and weberns and stockhausens and berlioz uh, uh berlioz um Boulezes of the world um uh, versus you know the other orchestras that suddenly became very very almost regressive and committed to you know the 19th century repertoire and backward um and even then it's not even that it's not like they're performing renaissance music or things like that that are also profoundly interesting and it's a sort of bach somewhat mozart haydn handel you know this it, it becomes very very specific and i say you know this these musicians are capable as a as a living entity a, a big a big kind of heterogeneous mix of colors of performing such phenomenal ranges of things let turn them loose let them do it yeah. my favorites are shows that do both in a single show you know one of the best concerts i ever participated in was the american youth symphony here in los angeles did a concert at ucla where they invited three different composers who had written video game scores to come present their work on stage alongside a, a piece from the repertoire of their choosing and why that piece is a particular inspiration to them so they paired my music from journey with what I had suggested, which was the 4C interludes of uh, from Peter Grimes by Benjamin Britten. Another composer friend of mine, Jason Graves, had the Firebird Overture combined with music of his from a game called The Order 1886. And I thought this is a phenomenal concert because the audience, some some of the audience- It's, it's not preordained, to... it, it is spontaneous in what's happening. Yeah, and, and, the audience, and the audience has also shown that a composer in the 21st century is not acting in a vacuum from the, the shoulders of the right. giants we stand on. We were, it's all one continuous lineage. It's acknowledging and respecting the history that brought you here and then launching into the future with the comfort that you jump and you, somehow in middle of the air, you will land on your feet. And one hopes it's worth the jump, <laughs> even if you don't land on your feet. Oh, well, that's it. <laughs> but I think, you know, that almost summarizes the conversation, right? When you look at curiosity experimentation i was going to ask the question so why would somebody not interested in classical music want to come to this event here of symphony new hampshire's game overture and i think that we've already that is part of the answer is because it's it's not the same old it's got some twists and turns to it and you're going to be conducting a piece of it that's my understanding as well uh, yeah i'll be conducting my music plus um one others that's a bit of a has become a bit of a staple in the world of game music that was part of a game that came out in 1998 uh, called Final Fantasy VII. It's it's sort of one of the enduringly very popular works called One Winged Angel. Um, and I just basically asked Roger, what else are you planning on performing? And and he's done this for me in the past where I, I just kind of went shopping on the on the set list Ooh, as it was. Can I conduct said, this? I'd like that one. That one sounds fun. I've never Love done it. that one before. Wonderful. Um, 
So yeah, it should be it should be good. Yeah, that's the, what you said is absolutely true. The the goal is for them. It's it's not to make it people feel like they're being sort of tricked into appreciating orchestral music or anything like that. It's just come here, music um, uh, that you know you may not have heard live, but you and shows what it's heard. capable of. You're showing you know, right. It's the absolutely. full range of the instruments, the players, the conductor, the orchestra. I think that Absolutely, it's yes. great. Uh, I want to thank you very much for your time. I appreciate you joining us here on Keith Spiro Communicast, and I look forward to the concerts. It's my pleasure. Thanks so much for, for the invitation. And yeah, we'll see you in a little over a week. <laughs>